Oslo and the University of Gothenburg. Siri earned a ERC starting grant in 2019, and she is now the PI of the Lechnes Affective Brain Lab in Oslo. And today we will learn more about her research group's work while listening to her talk, Neuromodulation of Subjective Experience. So thank you so much for being here with us today, and the stage is all yours, Siri. Thank you very much, Lina. All right, let's see if we can now get this screen sharing to work. There you go. Oops. Turn in. All right, so Lina, you're seeing it now, right? Now I can't hear anything. And look, I need to look, look. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to go ahead uh, and speak then. So, i given this broad uh, title um, because what we're really interested in, in in Lab Lab, and we only really have my name on the title because it allows us to be Lab Lab, which we all find amusing, um, is that we are really interested in the various sort of different uh, chemical systems and, and ultimately the link between, um, you know, the brain and subjective experience. Uh, but I will be talking almost exclusively about opioids today. And uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll share some of our enthusiasm for this, you know, fantastic and intriguing system. Um, and Basically, one of the many reasons that I think you should be really interested in, in, in John's opioids is that they are really important uh, for a cat's responses to catnip. Um, let's see if we can get this video to work. No, that's not look good. Uh, let's move on. Um, right, so you know when cats will sometimes rub against a certain herb, um, this is called catnip, and it turns out uh, this paper from a couple of years ago, this Japanese group seems to find the function of why cats rub against uh, catnip, and it's to do with uh, mosquito repellents. So essentially, they will get fewer mosquito bites. Um, and uh, this appears to be a beta endorphin, so an opioid mediated process, and they showed this. Uh, what is really amazing about the paper is that they showed the, the catnip response not just in house cats but also in, in huge like lions and tigers and stuff. And then in the house cats, they tried to give them this antagonist naloxone and then showed that they didn't respond. Essentially, they stopped rubbing against the herb. So opioids uh, have a lot of different functions. And um, the reason, of course, is that they are uh, extremely widely distributed in the brain. Uh, and also in the body, especially in the intestine and the digestive tract. Um, this is a map from uh, the Finnish group. They've actually released a database with over 200 resting state um, opioid receptor, neopid receptor maps. This is roughly uh, what it looks like. And we have uh, opioid receptors almost uh, everywhere in the brain. Uh, but it seems from the animal literature that we can conclude that they are organized in these microcircuits that regulate specific behaviors. So the be you know the sort of best known is the pain modulatory circuit, which includes connections between the RACC and the PEG and the spinal cord. Um, and then there are other circuits described in, in rodents, such as the, the fasting eating circuit, where if you fast the mouse, it will eat a lot more. And this is due to encephalin release in the dorsal rapha nucleus, um, projecting to the nucleus accumbens. Then there are really important roles for endogenous opioids, again, in the, in the rodent, habemula, the sort of anti-reward circuit, which is then inhibited by opioids. Um, and then there's a beautiful work. These are just some of the microcircuits that have been described. Some really beautiful work from Canberra's lab showing that opioid stimulation in these little um, microcircuits known as hedonic hotspots means that the animals appear to actually like flavors more. Um, 
And I'll show you how uh, he sort of um, found this because we essentially um, tried this out, not with opioids, just with liking responses in uh, my twin babies uh, when they uh, were just four months old and right before they started eating uh, other food than breast milk. So basically, to try and map out what opioids do for reward in the rodent brain, Cambridge did similar experiments in rats. To the left is Irene, who's getting the babies. sweet drink, and to the right is Mia, who's getting the bitter. So you can <laughs> you can see Irene licking in a way that means that she gets the content into her mouth, and this is a very stereotypical liking response. Whereas Maya's is more bitter, and she's a uh, sweet is eighty three molar. Um, so the types of videos that Cambridge is using to to find this a good regulation of the liking responses is essentially this for a sweet flavor in a rat. But, you know, with the video from below, it's leaking to get a lot of the sugary substance into its mouth. Um, all right, so today I won't primarily be focusing, um, you know, on my babies. They're now almost uh, eight years old. And I'm happy to just reassure everyone that is that is the only scientific experiment I've ever run uh, on my kids. Um, today I'll be talking basically about both the endogenous opioid system but also about opioid drug effects. Um, we, we study these uh, intensively and we think, you know, the opioid drugs have these effects because they act on the endogenous system. But because opioid drugs are given, you know, whenever you have very serious trauma or surgery, um, you know, and, and they have this link with addiction, it is actually really important to understand the opioid drug effects in, in, in their own right because of the scale that they are you know, distributed to people. Um, so I'll be talking about mood and reward responsiveness. And within reward responsiveness, we'll talk about social bonds because ultimately our social world relies on sort of reward and, and motivation. Keep us going, then we'll talk about pain. Uh, and uh, stress and linking this a little bit to the addiction potential of opioids. All right, so do opioids enable us to enjoy life? Well, I certainly used to think so. Um, and then we started running uh, studies in our lab. We've been doing this for over a decade now. We have a number of, of um, different studies and both agonist studies and antagonist studies. We basically, we don't see a mean shift in people's, you know, affective state. And we ask a lot of questions, you know, being sort of psychopharmacologists. Um, that's what you do. And people's mood is typically the same. Whether you block the endogenous opioid system or you give, in, in our case, either oral morphine or uh, intravenous oxycodone. Um, and there is a... Then when I went back to the literature, I realized I just hadn't gone far enough in the past because it turns out as, as far back as 1955 was the first paper um, from uh, Louis Lasagna and, and uh, uh, Henry Beecher where people were given heroin intramuscular <laughs> injections. Uh, they were in a lab setting and they didn't like it. Overall, this is a quote from one participant who responded to heroin by feeling irritable, shaky, unsteady and nauseated and angry at the doctor for making him sick. And overall, when they sort of summarized uh, the findings, they showed that amphetamines were rather sort of euphoric, but heroin and morphine actually had some overall sort of negative effects on, on people's affective state. So opioids may not be all that they're cracked up to be, um, but we'll, we'll sort of return to this question. Uh, but what I think it's also really important to note sort of the opposite side of the, code, uh, of the coin is that when we block endogenous opioids uh, pharmacologically, which you can do with naltrexone, naloxone, or, or some other drugs, um, there is actually really strong support that in healthy people, mood stays the same. Um, and there's even some anecdote, sort of um, some evidence that this is the case if you go over weeks. Um, that so your mood seems to be fine and. Um, but to try and find out, well, 
why is it that so many people will say, well, I've had opioids and they made me feel great. I love them. You know, what do you mean they don't change your moods? Well, first of all, if you're thinking that as, as somebody in the audience, recall that most likely you will have had those opioids for pain. And having pain relief is extremely rewarding in its own right. You know, so it's basically you're suffering and then suffering is taken away. But you feel great in contrast. Uh, but of course, the other thing is that when you've had opioids, you know, in a medical setting or even, frankly, in a recreational setting, this all won't have been placebo controlled. It will have been open label. So all of your expectations and all of the sort of collective cultural expectations that everyone has about opioids. I certainly used to think, you know, I tried 10 milligrams morphine before we ran our first morphine study. And I felt like a complete failure as a reward scientist because I didn't find it rewarding. It actually gave me a bit of a headache and like red cheeks. But it turns out this is a, a rather common approach. So in any, any case, we discovered that in addition to running lab studies, we could move into hospitals because people are given opioids in hospitals every day. And in collaboration with Gernot Ernst and the group and Marie Aikimo, we started asking people, on the operating table, so they're given an injection, a large dose of an opioid, and we ask them how good do you feel and how anxious do you feel right before and one minute after when the opioid, you know, intravenous opioid had taken effect. So we did this in 269 uh, surgery uh, patients, and uh, just to show you that the drug is definitely working after one minute because on average, although we have a very few people here on, on zero, most people are, are feeling quite high. But this does not translate into a mood boost. So with the first 160 who got remifentanil, we actually see that they feel a little bit worse. Um, in this, uh, there is vision sort of uh, support, uh, moderate uh, support for an actual decline in, in sort of feeling how good they felt. With oxycodone, which we switched to um, at this point, this is open label and, and sequential, at least they didn't feel significantly worse, but they also did not, on average, feel better. Although, of course, a subgroup of, of patients, roughly one in three or um, one in four in the remifentanil group, did feel you know, a, a mood boost. But then an equal proportion of people actually felt worse. So what we did see, which I think was reassuring, because the part of the reason that the drug is given, is that we did see evidence for both drugs that they did feel a little bit less anxious. Um, so, but this effect is really rather small. It's like less than half a point on an 11 point scale. And it's entirely possible that this is a placebo effect at the sort of at the group level. So, opioid effects, you know, on mood may not be all that they were sort of cracked up to be. However, there's some interesting studies um, combining opioid antagonists and blocking endogenous opioids with other drugs. For instance, there's a study um, of ketamine effects on depression, where you, you know with the psychedelics you can get these ginormous effects on how people feel dramatically better. And, uh, and this effect, then, then they combined the ketamine with an opioid antagonist, to see if it was opioid mediated and it actually worked so much sort of less well that they stopped the trial halfway through. So I think the jury is out on, on this one, but it is possible that when we give some of the other psychoactive drugs that they do exert their effects partly through endogenous opioids. Um, and this is another example from uh, studies uh, of amphetamines, and there's also um, quite a lot of evidence that if you block endogenous opioids, you do block part of the sort of good effects of other medications. So we sort of summarize, summarize, it seems that opioid drugs boost mood only sometimes and in some people, and you don't need your endogenous opioids for everyday mood, uh, but they do appear to contribute to mood effects of some psychoactive drugs, such as ketamine, which in, it is, however, possible that what we're seeing there is a blockage of the placebo effect. So what about responses to rewards in, in the environment? This is, of course, a, a really sort of massive driver of, of your mood, not right there in the lab, but the rest of the time in, in your actual life. 
So we've looked into this, and this is our very first opioid study in the lab here in Oslo. We gave um, up to first initially 30 and then another um, 19 healthy young men. We gave them three drugs and three different occasions. And we looked for behaviors that would be boosted by morphine, which you know is an opioid drug and acts on the opioid receptors, but also you know reduced by naltrexone, which blocks it. So we're looking for this sort of staircase pattern uh, across a range of different reward tasks. And that, you know, surprisingly enough, perhaps is what we find sort of um, back translating the radiant findings. So we see it for the young men's responses to uh, faces of uh, beautiful young women. We see it in their visual attention maps, which I find fascinating. This is how much time they spend looking at the eyes and also how much they explore the faces. We see it in their responses to very sweet sort of sugar solutions. Then there are a few um, sort of tasks where we don't see it. We don't see any of good uh, evidence of opioid modulation of responses to being touched and also not really very strong responses to enjoying music. Um, but we do see it in um, sort of value based decision make tasks. Uh, they seem to be more focused on um, the high value rewards. Um, but one of the things that I got really interested in, uh, sort of having done all of, you know, all of these studies, is that we seem to see a pattern where if you give a drug, you're boosting the reward value, especially for high value rewards, and then the opposite with the antagonist. Uh, but if you block essentially most of the opioid receptors um, in, in healthy people, they still you know, experience reward, it's just reduced, but there's still a lot of reward there. And this sort of contrasts um, a little bit with the rodent findings, um, except when you start looking into it, actually, if you antagonize uh, the rats, they still, they also still seem to enjoy the food. If you if you look at their sort of licking behavior in the video I showed you before, uh, but what you block is this reward boost, either way, if they're hungry or starved, or um, if the, if you microstimulate them in a different part of the network. Um, so we're sort of summarizing from this that maybe what opioids do is they don't really regulate your sort of your generic appreciation of, of things, but they add maybe they help add a little bit of a hedonic gloss, a sort of a you know the cherry on top type uh, response. And of course, one of the big cherries on top of this world is uh, other people. And there have been some, uh, and in non-human animals, the effects, um, obviously not of people, but of uh, con specifics are quite dramatic. For instance, the new knockout uh, mouse that doesn't have any opioid receptors um, has a lot of def deficit in, in showing preference. So it doesn't even prefer its own mother. Um, and in prairie wolves, it's also been shown that they really need neopoids to form um, bonds sort of you know and, and form these monogamous relationships. So what happens in, in humans? Um, well there are some really fun tasks for instance Charlie Van McDonald who did this closeness building task they got pairs of strangers together and they had to talk about themselves and this um, sort of makes people feel closer but it also makes them happier. They usually show a little bit of a mood boost. And um, blocking opioids in this task basically reduced both, both how much they shared and also how much they got a mood boost from it. So again, we're sort of seeing that it's not necessarily how well they feel, but it sort of it boosts the, the cherry on top type of mood boost you might get from being intimate with somebody. Um, and then we've meta-analyzed the, uh, the literature on, on sort of social connection. And usually what people do is they simply ask, how connected do you feel to other people, either strangers, or other people in your life? Um, and uh, overall, we see uh, a significant effect where if you block infectious opioids, uh, people do feel less connected, uh, but it is uh, really rather small. And the evidence from People with opioid use disorder who treated naltrexone over time, they don't seem to experience this. They, if anything, they, they typically report the opposite. So, but there is something, and the thing about other people is that 
you know, getting this mood boost from being around other people, or feeling connected to other people could potentially accumulate over time. So that's one of the sort of big outstanding questions from, from this uh, line of research. And now we're going to move over to pain because here we have some truly uh, astounding and very surprising uh, findings. So first of all, when I went into the opioid field, I knew that opioids, I mean, everyone knows that opioids are strong, you know, painkillers. Um, but I didn't know that they are really unpredictable. So when you get an opioid, they have to ask you how much pain relief you get. They can't just assume that it will work. Um, so you have to individually titrate. And this, what you see here on the screen is um, an illustration of this in a really large and well-controlled lab study from Martin Angst's group. And so all of his participants got the, an opioid drug and um, placebo. And what you're seeing here is the change score. So they get pain relief. Um, and the mean pain relief is the black line, horizontal line. Um, and each individual's response, which is calculated as the difference between opioid and placebo, is um, the vertical lines. So you can see that, you know, on average, everyone gets, um, you know, pain relief. The group gets pain relief, but there is a subgroup of people who actually do not show, uh, you, you know, you actually get more um, pain after the opioid than after placebo. And there are some other people who are very, very strong responders. And uh, this is really well known among uh, sort of um, uh, treating physicians that they know that they can't ex exactly predict how much analgesia you will get. Um, and I've sort of looked into this a little bit. So we used to use opioids for a lot of, of, of different things, uh, but because there have been sort of past opioid epidemics, um, countries started regulating the use and saying the only use where it's really worth the risk of an addiction and, and sort of, you know, havoc in society is for pain. Um, and you can, but other people, you know, people would previously use them for cough suppression and sleep. They actually work really badly for sleep, so we probably shouldn't do that, um, and obviously to get high. Um, right, let's get through this. But so, but I was, I've been really baffled because everyone knows opioids are strong, you know, painkillers, is that there isn't actually any evidence that they are stronger than the alternatives. And the alternatives are things that, you know, we can all buy over the counter, like paracetamol and, and ibuprofen. So, First of all, it's really surprising that in the analgesic literature, there is a scarcity of what's known as head-to-head -head comparative trials, where you just compare different drugs for, you know, to treat pain. Um, but when you look into the ones that exist, you see that um, people who come into the emergency room with, you know, basically like a broken, you know, uh, wrist or, um, you know, extremity pain, you, uh, in this, in this paper, people were uh, randomized to four different medications. Um, one is ibuprofen and, and paracetamol, and the other three contain different opioids. And what you can clearly see from this graph that I made from their numbers is that you know the, the pain relief is the same. It doesn't matter if they got opioids or not. Um, they replicated this in the you know in a different uh, cohort. And here you can also see the huge variability in how much pain relief people get. From these different combinations. It doesn't matter if there are opioids in there or not. Um, they've shown it by sending people home with either opioids or non-opioid medications. Um, they don't work any better over a week. And uh, they've shown it for uh, chronic pain now on uh, a couple of uh, different trials. This one is over a year. So it's not that they don't work, it's just that they don't work any better than the alternatives. But what about intravenous opioids? Because, you know, that's that. Um, and there I have to say, I was kind of relieved to find that there are some studies showing, yes, they are actually better. Uh, but there are also other papers showing that sometimes they're even worse. So, for instance, for renal colic, which is, a, a, you know, infamously excruciating, morphine worked significantly worse than the two non-opioid alternatives in a, you know, rather sizable dose. And it also worked more slowly, which is what you really wouldn't think. So to sort of sum up, there isn't really any evidence that opioids are better than non-opioids for pain relief. They do work, 
they just don't work clearly better than non opioids and this um to summarize and actually there's you know writing in the big medical journals about this that the the the, the belief that opioids are uniquely powerful medications for pain control is a, is a myth and can drive over prescribing then there are other myths that can drive under prescribing um but opioids are you know popular drugs and they're associated with a lot of myths so one of those myths is that endogenous <laughs> opioids are incredibly important um, for, um, you know, for your own pain relief, you know, so like, so we basically meta-analyzed the entire literature and a lot of different studies. We found 66 papers where they gave opioid blockade and experimental pain to healthy volunteers. It's the, the results are very similar if you look into patient populations and clinical pain. Um, and this is an overview. <laughs> this is a first illustration of all of the effects. So the size of the bubble corresponds to the sample size. And um, what you can see here, I'll show you maybe in a, in a different, this is an Eggers uh, plot that shows a little bit of um, uh, publication bias, but I'll show you um, in a different plot, basically, this is the distribution of the effects. And you can see that they center almost entirely around zero with a lot of studies on the left side of zero showing essentially uh, less pain after opioid blockade. And this is the same whether we measure intensity, tolerance, unpleasantness, or pain threshold. And as you can see, these you know, sample sizes are rather large when you, when you meta-analyze all of the data together. And this contrasts enormously. So the mean effect size is roughly 0.2, which is very small. With, you know, these reports from um, people who have congenital insensitivity to pain. So essentially they, they don't feel pain. And pain, of course, acute pain is a very important alarm system. So you can get these um, deformities due to the fact that, you know, you have, you don't adjust your posture and etc. These are some of the x-rays and pictures from one population with congenital insensitivity to pain. And uh, another um, mutation that they looked into, they seem to have basically increased pre-proencephalin, which means that they have very enhanced uh, opioid receptor signaling. And if you give the opioid blockade to these people, they actually appear to feel pain and be sensitive to pain for potentially the first time in their life. Um, so that's a very dramatic effect and it sort of contrasts with what we're seeing, you know, overall in the meta-analysis. So we probe more because it's enormously variable, the, this effect, and of course some of the studies show a really large effect. So, I mean, I really thought that if you block people's endogenous opioids, their endorphins aren't doing their job and they should have a lot of pain. So we've now sort of done a pre-registered division of this literature into different kinds. So as you can see at the top, there really isn't any, doesn't matter if the measure is pain intensity or unpleasantness. It doesn't matter if you give people electric shocks or, you know, ischemics or chemical pain or, you know, these, these are all, these effect sizes are all really small. The only thing that really sort of stands out is that we see a clear and sort of sizable effect that if you block endogenous opioids, people don't show that much of a placebo pain relief. And there's also um, a heightened response to sort of brain stimulation and algesia, although this is in a small sample, so it would need to be replicated. All right, so to sort of do an interim summary, it seems that opioids regulate a lot of different, different behaviors, but they do so with much variability and the effect size in humans are, are modest compared to what you might think if, if you sort of base yourself on, on the human, on the animal literature. Okay, so the final part of my talk, um, I can't, I don't get any feedback from the screen, so I'm hoping I'm roughly on time. Um, but I'll talk to you about a, a, the sort of the biggest and grandest and most exhausting study that we've done in the lab. Uh, where we tested the effects uh, and the interactions between opioid drugs and stress. And this was a um, project that I co-designed with Marie Eichemol and Duro Lusset in the lab uh, many years ago now, back in 2017. And the main hypothesis that we wanted to test was that 
the link between basically sort of different kinds of, of uh, sort of um, mental health issues and, and physical health issues, there is a strong link between stress and um, addiction. And we thought it would essentially um, work in this in this matter that if you're stressed you might want to take an opioid drug and then if you get relief you this might boost sort of your wanting and, and sort of boost this kind of repetitive pattern of you wanting to take the drug again. Um, so these graphs have a lot of information in them and we just pre-printed um, this <clears throat> manuscript. So what we did, we got 63 healthy uh, participants to come to the lab four times. We randomized them so that they got uh, they got twice, um, they got a stress induction and twice they got an opioid drug. Uh, and uh, so there was a two by two design. And uh, we gave them an intravenous dose of oxycodone, which we sort of piloted, piloted to try to get sort of a, a dose that would Give, be noticeable and give um, a feeling of drug high in most of our participants without too many of them vomiting or showing other side effects. And then the timing of this is that we, in, you know, we got them into the lab, and then at some point we we put them through a stress induction task, a trio social stress um, task, which we adapted so we could repeat it. We had a singing version of it, and what you can see on the left graph is that in the red line is that our participants got you know a sizable increase in their stress ratings which you can um which corresponds then to an increase in heart rate during the task and also eventually an increase in their cortisol uh, response then after the stress induction we uh, gave them an uh, injection of oxycodone and then we gave them a reminder task to make them feel very self-conscious telling them how we would judge them based on their performance on the, on the stress task. And then we gave them the opportunity to work to do an effort-based task to have to determine the size of a second dose. Uh, so this is a self-administration task where they press the button repeatedly uh, for two minutes um, to determine the dose. And to show you that, you know, the um, oxycodone really worked. So, and also the stress induction. So if you look on the left side, you can see that this, the stress induction, which is the first gray bar, um, it produced a dramatic drop in positive affect. But then after they get the drug, the stifled line, um, they, uh, or the placebo, they basically uh, go back to more or less baseline. And um, this does not actually differ depending on whether they get oxycodone or placebo. So sort of reminiscent of what we've seen before that the mood effects aren't very uh, substantial. Um, then, but they do get, as you can see on the second graph, very high and they also do like it more than they like the placebo uh, injection. And then our main uh, sort of question was, will our participants work to have more drug um, when we've stressed them. So the idea was we thought they would have stress and then they would feel the relief, they would feel sort of removed from the stress and then they would want to take the drug again. We've already seen that we don't really see that stress relief, um, but we do see an increase. They do work to have more drug in the stress condition compared to control condition. Um, however, this uh, effect is entirely driven by the men in our sample who overall want 12% more drug. And actually we, we probably have a ceiling effect here, whereas the women uh, on average want a little less after the stress condition. So it, this um, sort of increasing in, in effort-based sort of motivation or wanting is specific to oxycodone. We don't see it for placebo. So it made us wonder, well, maybe there's just something about the men, you know, maybe they got more, they just got more stress from the task or maybe they got better stress relief. Um, but we don't actually see that. The men did not get more stressed from the task. If anything, the women showed a higher response and um, they don't feel any better after, um, you know, after stress um, with, uh, you know, compared to the women and they don't get any stress relief at all. 
if anything, actually, what we see is that nobody really gets stress relief. But when we look at the buffering, so we show them, you know, this reminder task, uh, the women show some evidence that the opioid maybe makes them a bit less embarrassed about being judged. Uh, but we don't see that in the men. So overall, we basically, we thought that when you're stressed, you get an opioid, you want to take more because you've got relief. But now we're sort of tentatively concluding there is a link between stress and opioids and drug wanting, just doesn't seem to hinge on, on experiencing relief. So uh, some more take homes. It seems that opioids serve a lot of roles in the brain, probably also in the body. And this is reflected by their many effects and variable effects. I'm going to go out on a limb and just say opioids are overrated in, in what they do for human pain and mood and stress. Uh, but they are nevertheless addictive, and a lot of the known vulnerability factors converge on stress. Um, and we're wondering if there, you know, there are some potential sort of neural mechanisms shown in rodents that, you know, opioids might actually directly change motivation without sort of depending on this intermediate step of changing how you feel. So okay, so my absolutely final slide uh, is basically talks about the sort of history of opioids, and I'm hoping that this is the bit where if I haven't convinced you yet, you'll agree with me that we do need to really study opioids, although the other uh, neurochemical systems are also super fun. Um, so opioids, you know, opioids have, have really been prized by humans, uh, you know, for a long time. They find them in a lot of Stone Age archaeological uh, sites, and they're probably been used both for pain relief but also to get high because people of all times and all cultures have enjoyed getting high it seems to be actually sort of helpful at the societal level in terms of evolutionary um, fitness so in 1805 they crystallized morphine from opium and initially it was uh they people were hoping that it would be a cure of pain but also of opium addiction so that didn't work out. So then they synthesized heroin uh, in a couple of different times, so roughly 100 years later. And guess what? It was initially sold as a non-addictive cough medicine. So we fast forward to OxyContin, which many of you will have, will know, if not, you know, from the epidemic and from these, you know, Netflix series like, you know, Dope Sick. And Oxycontin was marketed very aggressively as a non-addictive formulation, uh, which of course is, is very directly linked to the ongoing opioid crisis, certainly in North America. Um, and then, and this is what I find really shocking. So we sort of we see this pattern, right? We're repeating of every new opioid supposedly being non-addictive, but it turns out it doesn't stop there. So in 2020. Uh, a paper in the emergency in American Journal of Emergency Medicine, which you know is a perfectly you know respectable journal, actually suggested they ran an RCT comparing morphine and oxycodone because they thought maybe we should go back from oxycodone and back to morphine because they thought morphine isn't addictive because people don't like it. So it is a safe. We have a lot of knowledge, but you know, as a field, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And we definitely need to understand opioids better. So thank you guys so much for listening. And I'm gonna say thank you um, to the team who did uh, all of this work. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Siri. Um, so, I wanted to say, I think that Crowdcast has changed the way you can ask uh, questions. So now you have to go to the right and there's like a small little box with a question mark and there is, that's where you can uh, leave questions. Um, okay, so, but I can start with a small question. So I was just curious, you, you talked about this with that it's uh, maybe just a subgroup of people that have this impact on mood and also on pain relief it's like just a, some people that have this so i was just wondering is there like a overlap in this group that have this effect and and also like what are are, are there like known predictors for how 
you react to to it like maybe age or personality or, or things like this right so i mean this is the million dollar question right sort of everyone's you know getting into personalized medicine and that's what i mean i find it so surprising we don't we don't really know um there is a um, i've been starting to look into there's a genetic mutation that maybe one in a hundred maybe one in 200 people have that will explain you know that they literally have fewer opioid receptors so they need a higher dose to have a response uh, but most of the variability i mean there, there's sort of twofold variability right your analgesic response varies but also how many side effects you get and how severe they are is also unpredictable and moreover if you responded initially well you can still get the side effects at any time if you, you know if you keep taking the medications there is a link with age in terms of the amount that people consume but not as far as i know in the efficacy or the side effects um they any statist will ask you if you get car sick or not you know and they have a little sort of a little list so you're more likely to get nauseous if you are in general more likely to get nauseous i think um but yeah it, it's fascinating i mean it's just we, we need to we need to put our heads together to try and find out what it is and and i suspect given that what we know from neuroscience about, about all of these sort of microcircuits is that if you think about it your brain is full of these small circuits with very sort of localized um, release of, of um, endogenous opioids that, that do a specific thing and then when you get a drug it washes over the entire system so depending a little bit on like where your, your system is at that particular time what maybe even like what you've been dealing with before could be a, a sort of potential predictor what is the most important how much sort of neural space is your you know, system taking up with different functions but I don't know, I find it fascinating to think about. It's very interesting. We also had a question from Michael uh, that relates to this a bit. So thanks for a great talk. Do you know perhaps if there are any differences in receptor densities in the opioid system between men and women that could potentially explain the, the divergence of effects in the stress relief study? Yeah. So we've, we've looked into this because, as I, as I said, uh, at some point, the Finnish group have released this little database with, with opioid pet data. So at least we know about the resting levels in, I think, like 150 Finnish males and 50 women or something. Um, and there are some interactions between sex and age. But at the sort of age range that our participants were in, and we actually worked really hard to get a more representative sample of Norwegians. So they're not typically students, not everyone is a, you know, has a university degree, etc. But in the age range that we're looking, um, that we're talking about in, in the stress study, um, women, men and women should be reasonably comparable in the sort of overall amount, but whether there would be you know, differences within regions, um, that's something we can look into. Um, and as with any sort of sex difference, I am hesitant to extrapolate beyond our sample, right? So what's sort of fascinating for us is we had pre-registered that we would, you know, model sex because it's well known to um, be a factor in your stress response. But we didn't, you know, we didn't have a hypothesis about men or women in, in the study. It's just that we can't not talk about it because it's there, you know, so blatantly obvious that it, it, this is driven by the men. And we sort of compared them on, you know, how much like the experience they have with, you know, alcohol and, and drugs. And, and they are reasonably comparable, actually, to the Norwegian population overall, um, in which, and the Swedish is the same, in which men do do a bit more illicit drugs than women on average um but whether you know this means that any man you know there is if you sign up to do a lab study where you get intravenous oxycodone you're not fully representative you're not a random you know 
you know, sort of recruit in that sense, right? Not everyone would do that. Um, but it is a very sort of well-known fact that there are many more opioid misuses who are men, or sort of are, you know, it is a bigger problem um, in men. However, the women who develop these problems develop very, they often have a lot of other problems too, a lot of psychiatric comorbidities. So we might be looking into a sort of a different, almost like a different coping mechanism where at least our, our women got the opioid and then didn't think, oh, you know, I, I have this stress state and now I got the opioid and that means I want more. Um, and, you know, if men do, that's just one potential explanation for why more of them end up with substance use issues. Thank you. I, I also just, uh, I, I think I missed with the stress study, like which type of stress test was it that was used there? Yeah, sorry, I, I've simplified it so much for uh, for some of the talks, but this, this is a, a really dynamic uh, study. So we used a, um, a sort of an adapted hybrid version of the TRIER social stress task. So our participants are standing in the lab in front of a huge screen where there is a, a live confederate and uh, who's speaking and on the silent panel, we eventually switched into um, a, a video recording because they're not saying anything anyway. So we, we got uh, uh, Molly Carlisle in the group, her uh, brother-in-law is totally acting and he, he's, he's a perfect uh, sort of panelist. He looks very judgy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so they basically interact with the person while they're in the lab and they are uh, on Zoom. And uh, then we record everything. Um, and then we show them the recording actually in a second step. Uh, and surprisingly, people don't mind being shown the recording. They think they will mind, so they get super stressed in anticipation of it. Uh, but they actually, on average, feel good about themselves about how they handle it. So that, that's a sort of a nice story. But it does it. I mean, yeah, people who've, who've done that. Uh, the true social stress task or different stress tests, I think we'll have this experience that it sounds awful, but people will feel sort of temporarily stressed and then they will recover very quickly. So when we first designed this, we actually wanted people to stay in a stress, sustained stress state, and we weren't able to induce that. They, they recover fully with placebo as well as with the, the drug within five minutes in terms of the subjective state. And then of course the the cortisol um, is heightened for a longer time. And then we had the iOS singing task as the second stress induction because everyone came four times. So, and then we had some, we, we designed some non-stress control conditions that also involved speaking with uh, confederates on, um, through, through the Zoom, but no judging. Do you think you would have like similar Results if you would have a stress test that was non non social, like I don't know, getting them frustrated or or like something that is completely without like a in, not in a social context at at all. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So one of the suggestions that I got that I think would be really fun to try would be to stress people with um with CO two. So you know, adding CO two to your uh, oxygen means. That you feel like you can't breathe, which is, of course is very stressful. It's also a way to induce sustained stress because you're going to stay stressed as long as you feel like you can't breathe. Um, so, so I think opioids might actually help for that in a way that they don't necessarily help for the social stress. Um, but whether they would, what they would do to frustration? This is a great question. I mean. What people describe often with opioids is that they get this sort of slight feeling of remoteness of not caring so much. But there is also an association between um, opioids and, and anger. So I'm not sure if, if I can predict, you know, and maybe again, it would be variable. Some people get angry, some people wouldn't care. Um, but yeah, as, as you, you see, on average, our participants are not really showing any relief and they're not showing any mood boost. But I'm sure once we look into the variability, just sort of the second stage, well, I'm sure we'll find a subgroup who are just completely loving it and then a subgroup who are like, ugh, not for me. 
Great, thank you. We also have a question from Corinna. Uh, she's asking, perhaps I missed it, but how was the reward boost tested behaviorally in mice or was it based on neural response to hunger and microstimulation as the idea that it's more a fine tuning than baseline regulation regulator is interesting thanks yeah so um in the in you know the studies on sort of liking responses and the hedonic hotspots from Cambridge's lab they actually measure the liking the licking responses so that's what they measure whether you know um how much they they lick in this sort of way that resembles what human infants do when they seem to appreciate something. And in the uh, the latest studies from Daniel Castro, for instance, they measure uh, consumption. So they literally what they what they block with naloxone in that in that study is is the so when the animals have been starved for twenty four hours, or fasted, I think you call it. Um, they eat a lot more, and with the naloxone, they just eat the normal, the regular amount. Perfect, thank you. Um, so if there are no more questions, we can instead move to Zoom to have a little bit more uh, in-depth discussion. So I want to thank you so much again for Siri for being here today and for your great talk. And I also want to thank the audience. Uh, and next week we will have a talk with Dr. Julia Cordero. Uh, the title of that talk is Gut Body Interaction in Health and Disease. So I will just send the Zoom link in the chat. Let's see if I can. There it is. Uh, and we will go there now. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right.